So let's just summarize what we understand about evolution so far. Now, in my example here, let's say you have species A and it has an allele frequency of a particular allele where P or the dominant allele is 0.2, Q or the recessive allele frequency is 0.8. Again, please do not memorize this. But I did mention that due to natural selection, selective breeding, mutation, non-random mating or genetic drift, the allele frequency can change. Okay, And when it causes a change in the allele frequency, it might also change the characteristic of the animals. So as you can see here, species A looks something like this, but over a long period of time, the future generation will look more significantly different. Now, in some cases, it may lead to the formation of a new species. And the process of forming a new species is known as speciation where you have um, you have one if you compare the group which existed many years ago they will say that this is species a and over a few generations they might say that this future generation over here is species b so species b came from species a through evolution now immediately some students will ask the question will evolution always lead to the formation of a new species or speciation not necessarily but for cambridge a levels we assume that evolution usually leads to the formation of a new species but uh, if you do some extra reading, we understand that in most cases of evolution, there will always be a change in allele frequency. And like I've put it over there, it may lead to the formation of a new species. Now, the question over here is, how do we then distinguish that this is species A and that is species B? Why do we make that distinction? To answer that question, we first have to talk about species. How do we actually define species? Now, the thing over here is, there are many ways to define species, by the way. Um, there is no one definition fits all. Uh, because, if I'm not mistaken, at the top of my head, I think there are, there are about five different definitions of species. I may be wrong, but there is one definition that we usually follow. Okay, and we will elaborate on the species definition in chapter 18. But for now, we just, for the sake of this video, I just want to show you one of the most common ways we define species. Now, immediately I'm showing you, I have a cat and I have a mushroom. So the question here is, are they the same species? Most students, even without understanding the definition of species, most students, if not all, would say, no, they are not the same species. The reason is because they have different morphological features. Morphological just means structural features like, you know, paws, uh, eyes, nose, ears. And the mushroom has the mycelium. It has that sporangium, that kind of umbrella shaped area. Uh, it has a kind of a stem. I guess you can call it that. But um, it looks obviously different from the cat. They also have different physiological features, which means their body functions differently. For example, please do not memorize this, a cat's stomach produces hydrochloric acid for digestion, but the mushroom does not have a stomach and it releases out digestive enzymes. So it's different from the cat in the way it functions. So obviously there are different species due to different morphological features and physiological features. Number two, you have a cat and you have an otter. Well, you kind of can assume that obviously they are still different species, but they kind of morphologically look more similar because the cats have ears, the otters have ears. The cat, the cat has two eyes, the otter has two eyes. They both have nose, they both have paws, they both have fur. But they are still visually quite different and they also have different biochemical features. When you're talking about biochemical features, we are usually referring to their DNA base sequence or amino acid base sequences in their proteins. So if the cat and the otter both produce the same type of protein, the amino acid sequence of their proteins will be slightly or significantly different. For example, hemoglobin. The hemoglobin in the cat and the hemoglobin in the otter would have have different amino acid sequences. That is what is meant by biochemical features. 
And number three, you have a cat over here and another, hey, there's another cat over there, but that's called a caracal over there, C-A-R-A-C-A-L. Now, even though they both look cat-like, they might not even uh, be the same species because they don't recognize each other as breeding partners. So they might not even meet or uh, have sexual intercourse with each other. That's why scientists also categorize them as different species, because they don't recognize each other as breeding partners. So what is the definition of species then? As you can see over here, here are a group of otters. Interesting fact, a group of otters would be usually referred to as a romp or when they are on land, you can call them a romp of otters. But if they are a group of otters floating on the surface of the water, you can call them a raft, R-A-F-T. So that's a bit of an interesting tidbit. Anyway, so when you look at this group of otters over here, are they the same species? Yes, they are. Because they are a group of organisms with similar morphological features, physiological features, biochemical features, and they are able to interbreed with each other to produce fertile offsprings. So what does it mean by this interbreeding and producing fertile offsprings? For example, as a situation, if I have two populations over here, and let's say when you put them together, they do not interbreed or they do not meet with each other. Because they don't meet with each other, they might not recognize each other as partners because they are quite different. Scientists can categorically classify them as species A and species B. So they are different species. No interbreeding happens. As an example over here, however, let's say that you have one population here and one population here. And let's say they successfully interbred with each other. That means they reproduced with each other. But when they got the offspring, the offspring is infertile. What does it mean by infertile? Even though the offspring is formed, that offspring cannot reproduce. It cannot grow up and reproduce. Therefore, if all their offsprings are infertile, we would also say that these two populations are different species. For example, species A and species C. Okay, one such example of this is the donkey and the horse. The donkeys and the horse might be able to interbreed with each other and you may get something known as a mule, M-U-L-E. However, in most cases, notice what I say, in most cases, there are some exceptions, but in most cases, the mule is infertile. It is no longer able to reproduce. So we can categorically say that the donkeys and the horses are different species. Another such example in another situation, let's say you have two populations over here. They managed to interbreed and they produced a fertile offspring. A fertile offspring means that particular offspring will grow up and it's able to reproduce as well with other organisms in the same group. Therefore, we can assume that in these two population, they are the same species. As an example, a cat and a cat produces a kitten, and that kitten can grow up to become a cat to continuously reproduce. That is what is meant by this whole interbreeding and producing fertile offsprings. So I hope you understand that when it comes to the definition of species. Now, one important thing that we have to understand over here is how do new species form? Now, as a general overview, we understand the concept of evolution and we know that based on what we studied uh, when I talked about evolution, I told you that over a period of time, new species can arise from old species. As you can see in this particular diagram here, uh, was a species that existed and through evolution by natural selection, genetic drift, mutation or such, they could evolve to become different species of cats, lions and tigers. But we can't see species forming in front of us. We can't see new species arising with our eyes in most cases because the process takes a fair bit of time. But we can understand that in most cases of speciation or the formation of new species, it boils down to a few principles. And the principles are as follows. 
in most cases, you start off with this group of organisms here called species A. Now, I know species A must have variation. They must look slightly different. But for the sake of simplicity, I'm just going to make them look uh, quite similar to each other or exactly the same. But just do note that they do have some genetic and phenotypic variation. Yeah. Now, what usually must happen is in that population of species A, there must be a separation of the species to produce two populations or even more sometimes, two or more populations. This process over here is known as reproductive isolation. Reproductive isolation just means that this population and this population are not able to reproduce with each other anymore, obviously, because they have been separated. Now, due to reproductive isolation, it would lead to something known as genetic isolation. Genetic isolation means that the alleles and genes cannot be exchanged between the two populations. What do I mean by that? Let's take these two organisms over here. Okay, we have these two and this one, these two. Can they reproduce with each other? Yes, they can because they are in the same environment. So when they reproduce with each other, they can get an offspring. That's fine. And, of course, these two organisms, can they interbreed with each other or reproduce with each, with each other? Yes, they can because they are in the same habitat or the same environment. However, how about these two? These two will not be able to interbreed or reproduce with each other anymore because they are in different environments. So, the alleles for this population will only remain within that population and the alleles of the genes in that population will only remain over there. Why is that such a big deal? I will explain that later. And over a period of time, they will undergo speciation in different ways. Why do they undergo speciation in different ways? Because they are in different environments. So the environments may have different selection pressures. And I will show you this later. And of course, eventually, they do not recognize each other. Even if they do meet accidentally, they might not recognize each other to be partners because they look so different from each other. So therefore, species A will speciate to become species B and species C. So long story short, they used to be the same species, but over a period of time, they might become species B and species C, and they don't recognize each other to be partners anymore. Even if a species B and species C meet each other, why would they not interbreed with each other anymore? Now, the reason for that is extremely important. We must know some examples of that, okay? So what prevents these different species from interbreeding with each other? What, what makes them, because they came from the same species, but why do they no longer uh, interbreed with each other anymore? The reason is because, as an example, let's take a case-by-case -case scenario. So as an example, what prevents different species from interbreeding? You have the species B and species C. The first reason they do not interbreed is they just don't recognize each other as breeding partners. The reason they don't recognize each other as breeding partners is because their appearances look different and they might have different mating rituals. As an example, if there's a peacock, the peacock is male, what it does is it spreads its uh, tail feathers, its tail, into this kind of like, an, like, a, like a hemisphere kind of shape and it starts to dance or jiggle or wiggle a little. So uh, that's how it will attract the partner. But if it does so in front of a crow, the crow is like, what the fuck are you doing? I have no idea. Like, the mating ritual is different because the crow does not dance and the crow would not understand what the peacock is trying to do. So they are like, yeah, not, not, my, not my style. It's not going to be attracted to that, basically. That is why a crow and a peacock will not interbreed with each other because, number one, they look different and, number two, their mating rituals will be quite different as well. But say that they do recognize each other as breeding partners, then what happens? Even if they do recognize each other as breeding partners, their sex organs, due to their different body structures, the sex organs might be incompatible. It might not fit or it might not be complementary. But then, what if the sex organs are complementary and they fit or they are compatible? Even if they are able to have sex with each other, it might be 
not po- it's not possible for the gametes to fuse with each other because gametes fusing needs to follow complementary receptors in these cells so in this case a gamete from species a cannot fuse with a gamete from species b and if the gametes cannot fuse you cannot get a zygote but again let's say that even though they are different species the gametes were able to fuse with each other what if the gametes fuse? They form a zygote. And in some cases, due to different species, the zygotes may not be able to divide and become an embryo or offspring. That means the zygote remains as a single cell and the zygote just dies off because it has some chromosomal incompatibility. But some students will ask the question, what if the zygote, you know, divides and forms an embryo? Even if it does form an embryo, and it gets the offspring, the offspring is in most cases infertile, okay? One such case of this is the donkey and the horse. The donkey and the horse, they are different species, and they might recognize each other as breeding partners. Their sex organs might be compatible. Their gametes might be able to fuse. The zygote might divide to form an offspring, but the final hurdle could not be crossed because the offspring is infertile so these are some factors that you must be able to understand that prevents different species from interbreeding with each other why doesn't uh, a dog and a cat interbreed with each other well possibly because they do not recognize each other as breeding partners why doesn't a cockroach and a beetle reproduce with each other maybe because their sex organs are incompatible okay why doesn't a tarantula uh, breed with i don't know like a, a giant jumping spider probably because the gametes are unable to fuse with each other okay um or the zygotes may not be able to divide and become an embryo and what prevents uh, a tiger what prevents a donkey and a horse from interbreeding they might be able to interbreed but finally the offspring is infertile so these are the hurdles that are in place to prevent different species from just you know, reproducing and getting weird hybrids running around. You don't want to see an otter, you know, with a Rafflesia skirt, you know, because the otter reproduced with a Rafflesia. That's so fucking weird, by the way. But anyway, that's my point, okay? So I hope you understand that these are the five, there are actually more than these five factors, but I would like you to at least uh, memorize two or three of these factors that prevent different species from interbreeding. So we understand that from species A to form new species, number one, they have to undergo reproductive isolation. Number two, the populations can no longer interbreed, leading to genetic isolation. No exchange of genes and alleles happen, and speciation takes place. And there are two types of speciation we are going to be looking at in the next video. And those two speciations are known as allopatric speciation and sympatric speciation. And we will be talking about each of these two types of speciation.